Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Game of Thrones podcast. I am your host, Carmine of Red Team Review, and I'm joined here once again by Preston Jacobs, as always. Hello, Preston. Fire and blood on the way to my dreams. You know, I'm still working on the fire and blood theme song. You could release this as as a uh, <laughs> you could release this as a ringtone. You know that. Oh gosh, there's going to be some people out there with like me me going fire and blood, and then they they answer their phone. That's what you're you're, you're saying is going to happen. Sure, why not? I'll, I'll cut that out and, and and upload it to people so people can download it. Oh, by the way, I hope you don't mind when we start doing Witcher podcast. Do you mind singing uh, toss a coin to your Witcher? Uh, sure, sure. If we ever get to the Witcher podcast, I I just I just assumed you were gonna be like really on it because you'd love Witcher so much, and then I'm like, okay, I watched Witcher for you, Carmine, <laughs> so that so that we could talk about it, and then you're like, yeah, 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 later. You know, now it's there, been there, like a freaking year. There, <laughs> there's a story behind it, and we'll get to it. But uh, okay. is season guys, two happening anytime soon? Huh? Season two of Witcher? Yeah, I think it is. Let's yeah. just get focus right. on Fire, Fire and blood. blood. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us once again. As always, we're available on SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, I think Google Play as well. No idea. But if we are available there, uh, please check us out on those platforms. Leave us a review. It does help a lot. Also, we are bringing back the Q&A sessions that we used to do like years ago. Um, we're bringing those back, so prepare for that. Uh, and, uh, yeah, any more announcements, Preston? Uh, no, just, uh, just chugging along, chugging along. So you're done with, uh, prepping for winter. That's completely done. Yeah, but I'm doing some Q&As with, with mm -hmm. regard to it, um, and before I decide what to, what to do next. Um, but, you know, I've got, I'm still doing theory videos and such and, and, and things, but we'll figure, you know, I've got, a, so those Q&As will take a while, because I've got, I'm going to do one for each, um, for each, uh, sample chapter so your q and a's uh, are for the sample chapters not for like the podcast yeah yeah for the sample chapters mm -hmm. and can i recommend a theory okay how about the the best character ever little finger i think we need more theories on little finger just that okay i mean i have i guess i could revisit him i did the little finger debt scheme but uh it'd be interesting to go back he's the best character you have to you, there's has to be more theories on little finger personal opinion but um okay I mean, so is it isn't the best character um uh uh dagmar cleft jaw no <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> That's the uh so okay so this chapter is incredibly long oh god very long and i can understand why george loves this character it, this is almost an entire novel within a novel but it's not even it, there's so little about actually Jaharis. Yes, Jaharis has some some pieces, but it's just like it's mostly about his just, family. Yeah, it's about his family, but it's just like the whole kitchen sink is thrown into this chapter. I don't know if he was just writing to try to get length to to the book, you know, got to get more new material, or he was just you know, we'll discuss it as as things go. But but it's just like wow, like you included this, you included this. Why? Like, what was the point? But we'll see. Yeah. I think it's because he, he enjoyed this family so much that he just wanted to put as much as he could. Honestly, I think there was way more in here that he was forced to cut out. Probably. Probably. It's not, It's so many tangents. And some of the tangents are pretty damn interesting. If they, ha if they eventually pan out into something related to Ice and Fire, I, I, I think it's worth it. But... But man, like, there's a lot of stuff where I'm like, I don't know if that's gonna if that's gonna relate to Ice and Fire. But like, like even the beginning, the voyages of Alyssa Farman. So know, let's start like, with that. Yeah. Uh, the chapter starts out with an interesting short story on what happened to Alyssa Farman and her journey. Her goal was to find out what was west of Westeros, and she took with her some of the some of Lord Hightower's grandsons with her. Uh, the story is told through Eustace Hightower, and this is one of my favorite moments in the Fire and Blood book. I love. He's pressed and sick of hearing this. I'm sure the audience is as well, but it has to be reiterated. I love anthology stories. I think they're great. Um, and this is one of those prime examples. They go as far west as they can until Hightower's men are like, we can't go any further. We saw a Kraken take one of the uh, the boats down. We got to go back. And they, you know, decide to go back. But Alyssa, she continues on. And 
perhaps some people have seen her in a shy, maybe her her boat. Who mm-hmm. knows? But Hightower, he tries to go back. He misses the Summer Isles, and he lands in Sotheros to where his his guys are completely decimated. They like go through the Game of Thrones version of Ebola and like snakes and so many other illnesses to eventually where they come back and. We get like this grand tale, and I really like this the first couple of pages in this chapter. It was really nice. I love mm. short stories and thrones. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting thing. I was thinking about the trip a lot. So they head out southwest. Um, and assuming that Westeros is in the, the northern hemisphere, um, they that means they're heading more and more towards the equator, which means they're increasing distance. Like the, it's harder to go around the world at the equator than it is at a higher latitude. You have mm-hmm. you have more distance to cover. So it's funny that they're heading down like southwest, like making it harder. Um, and they go out 12 days and then there's 14 days of no wind and then three days of storms. So they're not, they're not incredibly far actually from Westeros. Um, keep in mind that like Columbus's uh, trip across the Atlantic took a month. Um, so they're not, they haven't really gone that far. If you're thinking, if you, if you want to go on the, on, the, on the system of like California to China, that's, a, you know, that's incredibly long distance, uh, mm-hmm. you know, compare, you know, compared to, you know, uh, Columbus's, you know, Spain to Dominican Republic, you know, kind of trip. Um, so it, it is I, I do wonder why George is even bringing this up. Is there a point to the world being round? Is it going to come up? Is Daenerys's, you know, a Quaid's message to Daenerys, you know, to go to go west, you have to go east. Is that part of it? Um, does Mance Raider finding silk from a shy on the frozen shore part of it? You know, um, I don't know. Um, I just think it's world building, and I love the world building. Like I, I wish George yeah. would allow other authors to come in and write short stories in his own world. Yeah, it could be. It could be world building. Um, there's, there. So a lot of uh, fans have done, you know, analyses of of the distances um, of on the map and things like that. Stuff that George wasn't thinking about when he did a Game of Thrones. You know, like Westeros. Um, is pretty straight and boxy mm-hmm. uh, because it fits on boxy pages, and that's how it was designed. And then he kind of announces, well, you know, it's, it's, Westeros is maybe the size of South America. Well, if it's the size of South America, it shouldn't be boxy. That, that means, like, th- things should get wider at some point. Like, your map shouldn't be straight, you know, or, or else... You know, at some point there should be distortion because, you know, like like when we take our globe and put it out and uh, on, on a flat map, there's this, you know, it gets distorted. Um, you know, people have measured like, oh, the distance on the wall is kind of the same as the distances in Dorne because we kind of know the distance across Dorne and we know the distance of the wall and they're fairly consistent. So there's no distortion on the map. So um, maybe Westeros in the very north, like uh, past the wall, actually goes around the entire world. And, mm. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, the land of always winter might might be past the North Pole and things like this. Uh, but it might all just be by accident. We, we don't know. I, I, I don't think George was, when he, when he first made that land in the Game of Thrones, was thinking about it. And then, um, you know, things happened later uh, where it... it it's not so bad, like it surprisingly fits, um, you know, him making the random statement that it's as big as South America and stuff like that, but um, with, with latitudes and, and, and temperature and things like that. But, um, but we know that, you know, based on all of that, you know, Alyssa Farman, like headed southwest towards the equator, tried to cross, you know, at the equator, which is, you know, the widest point for trying to go around the world. Uh, she would have been much, much uh, better off heading towards the pole, heading towards, you know, Bear Island and trying it that way. Well, a- apparently uh, that was covered last chapter and uh, a previous king in the north tried that and had no success. No. So she wanted to have much more warmer weather. 
Or did he? <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of winter, by the way, we also get uh, a sneak peek at the potential devastation that winter can bring in Westeros for the upcoming Winds of Winter book. Because didn't mm. George say that we would get uh, sneak peeks in Fire and Blood at what's to come in A Song of Ice and Fire? Well, so you, metaphorically is the is that idea. Well, he talks, starts talking about the famine, but then there's the shivers. Right. So for a good part of two years, winter arrives in Westeros at this time, and with it comes this insane disease called the shivers. Basically, if you catch it, chances are you're going to die. And it tears through a good chunk of the continent, killing lords and small folk alike. And most notably, it takes out Lyman Lannister, uh, Prentice Tully, and as well as Princess Daenerys, daughter of Queen Alysanne. Yeah. Uh, which our narrator tells us she may well be the first Targaryen mm -hmm. in Westeros to die of an illness. Which is which is a big deal. That well, that that statement. Well, first off, I, w I want to say that you know, the the shivers. It sounds even though there there are these stories about people you know wanting to build fires and and boiling themselves alive in order to stay warm. You know, th these tend to be symptoms. The, the, how they describe the shivers sounds like the bubonic plague. Like mm. everybody hated the rats. Um, the bubonic plague was spread through rats, sort of. It was the fleas on the rats. And so there's even a, a portion where he says that at the Citadel, they studied the rats and they couldn't figure out, you know, where the shivers was coming from because it was probably on the fleas, not, you know, in, in the rats themselves. Um, so the rats were carrying the fleas. Um, and so then, there, then there's this, the, the shivers, which... You know, metaphorically, we're supposed to think about winter coming and things getting cold. But, you know, people say that, you know, uh, feeling cold is a common uh, feeling after getting a fever and things like that, getting, getting the bubonic plague. These are, are similar descriptions, not to this d degree where someone wants to be boiled alive to stay warm. But, you know, there, there's elements of it, of the bubonic plague uh, in the description of the shivers. Um, the uh, what I thought now regarding the death of um, what was it Gael? Is she the Daenerys. one who died? Oh, Daenerys. Yeah, Gael is another another daughter that dies. Daenerys, which um, you know, obviously like Daenerys fighting, uh, you know, the cold, the coming cold is is like this inevitable um, point in which we see ice and fire heading towards. But um, that the, the, the thing about her dying of disease is actually pretty, pretty huge because if, if Targaryens don't die of disease, and they never have, then you have to, one, say, okay, well, why is Daenerys dying? Like, was she poisoned for some reason? Um, but then there, there's also the spring sickness, um, and two Targaryens die of the spring sickness, suspiciously, the two right in front of um, Ares I, who was a puppet of Bloodraven. And so if Targaryens can't die, if Targaryens aren't supposed to die of disease, you say like, well, what killed those two Targaryens? Well, clearly, that makes it look like Bloodraven was murdering people in order to put Ares on the throne, who is, who is his puppet. Um, so that's interesting, though. I, also, if Targaryens can't get diseases, like, what's up with them? Are they genetically engineered to, to not get viruses? Like, why are they so different from, from other human beings? I can see the the genetic engineering part, but I also see it as kind of an RPG element. Um, mm -hmm. If you play uh, Elder Scrolls and Skyrim, when you <laughs> customize your character, you can pick which race you want to be. And I noticed the yeah. Dark Elves have a 50% resistance to fire, and some of the beast folk wow, wow. Um, have resistance to disease. And I kind of see it as an RPG element. But at the same time, yeah, I, I, do, okay. I, I do like the explanation they give in the chapter, which is fire runs through their blood. But I guess over time, I guess after so, so much incest, it probably dilutes it a little, which is weird because it shouldn't, mm. since they're all pure Valyrians, kind of. So... I don't, right. Maybe it's a genetic I mean, defect. I mean, again, I'm always looking to the to the sci-fi explanation. Like, if Targaryens are this ancient, genetically engineered people that that have been genetically engineered to have uh, psychic connections to um, to animals, to to dragons, you know, they might have been genetically engineered or selected, and you know, uh, 
to to not get sick from viruses, you know. So that might be something, but uh, but yeah, I mean, you're right that there's elements of that, like you know, elves. Do elves get colds? You know, in, in mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings. I don't know, but I do remember that that in Dungeons and Dragons that uh, they're more resistant to the, to disease. And aren't Targaryens essentially supposed to be like high elves or Valyrians in general? They're supposed to be yeah, high elves. Yeah. I mean, they're definitely supposed. There's definitely elements of that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, but yeah, it was. But during the Shivers, it was a pretty uh, bad period. Um, Lord Rego was uh, killed. Rego Draz. Rego Draz was uh, mm-hmm. killed in the streets, which mirrors the High Septon's death. In, um, oh yeah, the oh, that's a good Kings. one. I didn't catch that uh, one. Yeah, and Jaehaerys's reaction is actually like extremely harsh. Like the ca- the people that they catch, he's like, "No Nights Watch for you," and like you know, ex- um, executes them. And and uh, one of the girl, one of the people that killed Rigo, like it was a girl, it was the her father. She like turned in her father in order in order to get some food. Um, but uh, oh, and I want to talk about Daenerys dying and like the events there. So Daenerys is dying, and she asks for a dragon. And so they send off a word to Dragonstone, and after a day and a half. There was no word. And I was like, Dragonstone's only like a day sail away. Like, what, why didn't they bring a dragon to her? And then when, they, when she dies, Jaehaerys actually gets on his dragon to go tell them, like, don't bother. She's already dead. But, it's like, shouldn't they have already left? Like, shouldn't have the message have gotten there and they should have, like, packed up a ship and the ship would have been halfway? And, and why didn't he, like, just go get the hatchling himself? Um, would have been faster. Yeah, and why didn't she already have the hatchling? Like, aren't they supposed to, like, put c- eggs in their cradle and things like that? Um, you know, and, and, and so I do wonder, like, what, what on earth was going on? Like, why did they not give Daenerys a dragon earlier, like, like you're supposed to? And I was thinking about it, and I was like, well, maybe they didn't want... Um, right now, uh, their son, Aemon is the heir apparent. And I was thinking maybe they didn't want any competition for the throne. Like they didn't want to go through the whole deal with Jaehaerys and Dreamfire Reyna. Like they, they just wanted Aemon to have a dragon. So maybe caution or sexism or both? Probably both, yeah. Because mm-hmm. um, I remember Alysanne wanted Jaehaerys... Um, well, actually, Alysanne wanted Daenerys to be queen. So Daenerys would have been marrying Aemon. But Alysanne had her own dragon. So I don't know, I don't know what was going on. Like, why didn't they give Daenerys a dragon like, to start with? Well, not, not to go ahead, but we also kind of get this whole uh, Jaehaerys favoring the male in his family over yeah. what's, what's actually right than the female because... Aemon, before he dies, he does have a daughter, uh, Rhaenys, I believe, yeah. and she is looked over, but that's in the next chapter, which we will yeah. get to. The queen who never was, yeah. Mm-hmm. Rhaenys, so, the queen who never was, yeah. Also in the chapter, we get the third Dornish War, which is somewhat of a misnomer, considering the <laughs> Dornish houses never really commit their armies to it, but nonetheless, we get another Vulture King, this time allied with Rogar Baratheon's brother, Boris Baratheon. Um, the cool thing I, I found about this is that Jaehaerys slays Boris in single combat, which I thought was epic, while Rogar defeats the new Vulture King. Mm-hmm. And then we get, later on in the chapter, the actual fourth Dornish War, this time aptly named uh, the Prince of Dorne, plots to invade Westeros and ravage <laughs> the Stormlands because he felt that the Iron Throne was allowed to come into their territory during the third Dornish War without paying consequence. But Jaehaerys yeah. was right on top of that. Uh, he knew the plans, and together with his son, they annihilate the entire Dornish fleet before they even step foot in the Stormlands. And this accomplishment is highlighted by the fact that this is the first major battle in a war against another nation that had not seen a single loss of life on the Targaryen side. And at first I thought, well, what about Mm -hmm. the North kneeling to the first Aegon? But then I I guess you could argue that wasn't really a battle. And the war itself was against all of Westeros, so it doesn't really count, kind of not really. 
So you can argue Jaehaerys during the Fourth Dornish War yeah. is the first king in Westerosi history to win a major conflict against another nation without losing a single man on his side. So the um, there's a lot of parallels uh, to talk about in, in this. Um, so obviously, like, Rogar wanting to die in battle is just, you know, typical Baratheon um, mm -hmm. behavior, uh, very much like Robert, though ironically, like, Rogar ends up winning and ends up like going home and dying of natural causes, like in the least glorifying way possible. While like Robert, a, a, as much as people, um, I guess, well, actually Robert also like, I mean, Robert is shamed in that he's killed by a boar. Uh, but he, you know, he tries to, to twist it in his mind that, oh, this was an incredible battle against this like great boar. But in fact, it was like, most people viewed it as rather pathetic. Like, you know, like you defeat Rhaegar on the Trident and, and, and that's all glorious. And then you don't have to end up dying in battle. You end up, you know, drunkenly uh, getting gouged, by, getting mauled by a boar. And so he feels, he feels rather pathetic. You know, people, he tries to twist it on his deathbed, but. I never thought of it that way. I like that. But like Rogar as well, like he's trying to die in battle. Like he's trying to die this glorious way and he doesn't. You know, he ends up winning and goes home and dies of natural causes. Um, I actually kind of like, I never saw the whole Robert Baratheon trying to glorify his own death at the hands of the boar. I never saw it that way, but that's actually pretty, that's, I actually like that. That's not bad. I like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know how it is. He's like, have a feast, you know, uh, I got the bastard in the end and things like that. Um, the uh, the Fourth Dornish War, like, obviously, there's supposed to be some parallels, like, um, uh, it's fueled by revenge, which is supposedly Doran's uh, motivation for, for his war. But really bad motivation, though. He wants to go ravage the Stormlands because... The vulture, they came into their territory with impunity yeah. and the vul to take out the vulture king. And, and Mori and Martell didn't like that. So his revenge for them crossing his lands? Yeah, you got to remember that. Well, that's the thing is like you wonder what else was going on. Um, you know, were these the histories written by the winners? Like, was this really the, the motivation? Um, you know, was the Vulture King really this this evil bandit in the hills, or were they trying to create some sort of, uh, you know... Boogeyman? Boogeyman, right. And then in this situation, you know, in this, like, also, when we look at the modern Dornish, like, they're complete hypocrites. So, like, for example, in the Watcher chapter... Um, They'll talk about how, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they planned on killing. Um, Doran tells the Sand Snakes that that Cersei planned on killing Tristane, and we have no idea if this is true or not. But um, the the Sand Snakes sit there and go, oh my gosh, killing a child, what a monster Cersei is. Even though the Sand Snakes themselves were all about killing children, like they were ready to kill. You know, like uh, uh, Marcella and, and, and Joffrey and all these things. It's, they're, they're complete and utter hypocrites. And Tom, murdering Tom and like, they're complete and utter, utter hypocr hypocrites with no sense, sense of sympathy. And so I think it's, there, it's we're supposed to be hit, like hinting at this, that, these, that it's revenge. But revenge really does require a kind of lack of sympathy and understanding of the other person's position, you know? True. Like, it's all about me. Like, I've been wronged, and now I need to, like, get that person back. Well, what was their motivation for doing that, you know? And, um, you know, and is, will, that really, will that really help situation by, by striking back? So I think it's a bit of that. But I think it's ironic that, that Doran Martell is this big secret keeper, and in this situation... This Dornish, this Dornish prince couldn't keep a secret at all. And so they, you know, they're completely discovered and, and everybody dies. <laughs> so the last major event in the chapter is the Mirish bloodbath, which extends to Westeros. Essentially, there are two major factions in Mir. One of them wins and the other flees across the Narrow Sea, eventually invading Tarth. So Aemon Targaryen, Jaehaerys' son, 
rides there on his dragon to help plan the counterattack, and is then killed when a scouting party notices him with the Lord of Tarth. Now, the scouting party aim their crossbow at the Lord, but end up hitting the prince instead, killing him right then and there. Um, the chapter ends with somewhat of a somber note, with Alice Sane reflecting on her life, and how Mager the Cruel may have been cruel, but Father Time is even more so. And she dies hmm. shortly after her last daughter, Princess Gale, had killed herself. Now, I'm, I'm kind of condensing a lot of this, but we'll get yeah. to the other major uh, mm -hmm. points as well. Um, this was kind of depressing that Alice Saint, because you kind of go through her entire life. Oh, yeah. And <clears throat> correct, I, I don't want to overstep here. I apologize. But it reminded me of something you said a couple of years ago. How old are you now? Uh, 43. 43. Fuck. Okay. Damn, I've known <laughs> you that long? Fuck. So remember, you, you, you posted something on social media years ago, I think when you turned 40, and you were saying how you looked in the mirror and you almost didn't recognize the person you saw. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I'm like, I was thinking about that the entire, and feel free, I'll, I'll remove this from the final cut if you want. I don't want to like, <laughs> you know, overstep and insult you, but because you're not old. I just want to make that clear. You're not an old guy, but like, God, it's just because I'm reaching 30. Like I'm 28 now. I'm reaching 30. It's coming. It's it's coming. So <laughs> fuck. This is a really somber note, and how like she outlives almost all of her, all, almost all of her children. Yeah. I mean, I I think there is nothing crueler that I than I can imagine than to outlive your children. Like that's not supposed to happen. There's something perverse about it. I understand that in the olden days, like kids died all the all the time, but. Um, you don't want to outlive. You don't want to outlive your child. You know, you want your child to outlive you, uh, and so it's pretty. It's pretty rough it, for for Alison. Just daughter after daughter dying. Um, it's just blow after blow. You know, Alyssa dying in childbirth. Gail. So <laughs> so let let's get into yeah. this. And when, before we started recording, I said to you like I'm, I've been hanging out with you too much, and <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. So the one thing I noticed is that most of Alisane's daughters seem to fall into one of two categories mm -hmm. because a good chunk of the chapter doesn't really focus on Jaharis and Alisane as much as it does their their children. Yeah. But Alisane's daughter fall into one of two categories. They're either promiscuous and outgoing or they're the very symbol of innocence. And if any mm -hmm. of the quote-unquote good girls even think about sex, <laughs> prepare to die because you're yeah. gonna. There, I mean, there's a lot of the, the Arya Asha like uh, archetype that, that George R. R. Martin loves writing, mm -hmm. you know, like he, he's in love with this, of uh, this, this character, you know, the, um, the Arya, Asha, uh, Liana, tomboy, strong woman, um, sexually liberated uh, character, you know? Um, and so, you know, Alyssa is that, you know, and she's, and he loves it. He loves that character. So the first daughter, um, Daenerys, dies from the Shivers. Uh, the second daughter, Alyssa Targaryen, she dies shortly after giving birth to her third child with Balon, but um, that child also dies. She herself was, I wouldn't say promiscuous, she just enjoyed sex. Um, her favorite things right. in the world were riding a dragon and riding a dragon. So uh, she dies shortly after childbirth. I'm just... Uh, Taken off the list here. And then you have uh Miguel Targaryen mm -hmm. who joins the um the the the, the church. She dies yeah. from treating someone that has grayscale. She essentially becomes a nun. Yeah. Uh what else? Then you have Dela Targaryen, also very innocent, like Miguel, um, dies after childbirth. She was very shy, gentle, kind, but very like, you know, very whiny. Yeah. Uh, you also have, I'm skipping one because I'll get back to her. You also have Viserra Targaryen, who, kind of promiscuous, she's betrothed, she, she's supposed to marry a, a northern lord, but doesn't want to. So she sneaks into her brother Balon's bedroom, naked, uh, gets drunk in there, mm -hmm. and the day she's supposed to be shipped off to the north, she escapes and gets into like a weird drunken 
car crash with not well not really a car with but horse, with a horse yeah, yeah. The horse crash and she falls off the horse and breaks her neck so she dies during a drunken race across king's landing and gail targaryen princess gail she is also very kind and simple-minded as they say uh found sex when a random singer traveling singer came to court uh she fell in love with him had his child the child died stillborn and Gale, overcome with grief, kills herself by drowning herself in the black water. And the only one, and of course, Aemon Targaryen, not her daughter, but he dies from a crossbow. I'm taking him off the list. Yeah. And then you have the last surviving daughter, Sarah Targaryen, who is every father's nightmare, I can imagine. Uh, she, <laughs> she, her whole life is just... Well, I mean, she's like Liness. She's like Liness Hightower, right? Like she, she, yeah, yeah. She goes off and becomes this really important, uh, you know, uh, high class sex worker. Thank you. I uh, there you go. Um, I, I like how in the chapter, Jaharis was like, "Yeah, she's in lease. How do you think she got there? She has no money." I'm like, "Oh, that's right. She doesn't have any money." So, I mean, do you do you know, I I can jump right into like uh my 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 conspiracy like situation on like why there's such a so much tragedy is is hitting uh the children of Jaharis and Alisane. I mean, go for um, it. But but just 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 so we're clear, um three Targaryen kids from Alisane survived the chapter. Balon yeah. Uh, Vagon Targaryen, he becomes Archmaester, and mm -hmm. Sarah, she survives the chapter, apparently becoming a wealthy woman in Volantis. So yeah, well, I mean, if 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 we're going to conspiracies, right? So let's say let's let's make the big jump, and this is a big jump that the Maesters really do want to, or the Faith, one of them really does want to get rid of dragons. Okay. And they kind of reluctantly accepted Jaehaerys and Alysanne, um ruling because they didn't want Dreamfire Reyna ruling. Because Dreamfire Reyna was super special and, and, and everything is hatching like around her. Um, and so, you know, I do wonder about these hatchlings. Like everyone's talking about hatchlings, but were, were, are these hatchlings from when Reyna was on Dragonstone? Like, why don't we I hear about... I was wondering about, that too. Right, like, why didn't Daenerys have a hatchling of her own? Like, when they didn't they give her an egg? Did, couldn't she hatch an egg? The implication is that Daenerys couldn't hatch an egg or or something. But nonetheless, like, things aren't going well. Maybe she's special, maybe she's not. But it's it's funny that they're they're focused like that. There's such tragedy to this huge family, like one after the other. Like Targaryens aren't supposed to get sick. And Daenerys dies of something that sounds like a sickness. Well, you know, that could be poisoning, you know? Um, so we get, to, we get to, so Aemon claims Caraxes and Balon claims Vagar. Um, and it's interesting because they're, they're thinking like, okay, maybe Aemon should marry um, Alyssa. But Alyssa wants to go for Balon. Um, and I wonder, like, was she going for Balon because Balon has the bigger dragon? <laughs> you know, like these these little consp like conspiracies <laughs> in dragon. my mind. Like, yeah, yeah, big, bigger dragon, quote unquote, right? <laughs> like, you know, was she thinking about rule, and then, or did she detect that there was something special about, you know, Balon? Um, and and so like, but whatever the case, like, Alyssa. Um, Aemon instead has to marry Jocelyn um, Baratheon. Who, Jocelyn Baratheon, who's I guess Targaryen enough. Like, keep in mind that R R she's what like half Valarian, and Rogar is what a quarter Targaryen. So I guess they figure that's close enough. Um, and, you know, whatever the case. Then somebody convinces Vagon to go off and become a maester. Like, okay, well, there's another one. He's not having kids if he's a maester. Like, maybe he was special after all, you know? Well, I think, I believe it was uh, Grand Maester Elisar who basically says he couldn't be a maester because he has no interest in, like, helping other people. He's more <laughs> bookish, so he should be the archmaester. He should study right. to be that, which he becomes. 
but you know, some, somebody that's so bookish, like what if he like starts figuring out, you know, the science of dragons and things like that, you know, mm. who knows? Um, but whatever the case, he's not having kids if you send him off to the Citadel. Um, uh, Alyssa, by the way, is specifically told not to claim Balerion the Black Dread. And instead, she claims a rain, uh, like a Melis, a, a much smaller dragon. I'm, you know, I'm guessing a, 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 a Dreamfire Reina hatchling. So, I mean, I, you know, I wonder about that. Like, what were they trying to do? Why didn't they want her to have that much power? Did they, did they not want some sort of like, if she had Balerion the Black Dread and Balon had Vagar? They would have the two biggest dragons, and then Aemon would would just look like, you know, nobody. Um, anyway, they they have Viserys the fir, uh, the first to you know as a dragon rider. Uh, then we talk about like Dela, who um, they sent. Now Dela, I think, is especially interesting to talk about because she's um, considered stupid and scared of everything and weak, right? Mm-hmm. And remember, like, Bloodraven tells us that, or the, the Children of the Forest with Bloodraven tells us that those that are weak and, and not robust carry the gift. And if we remember, like, Dela, her child is Emma Aaron, and Emma Aaron is the mother of Rhaenyra, who is the most special Targaryen, you know, we, we, we're going to come across. So... Dela is, is a super special one, uh, carrying the gift, passes it to Emma Aaron, who passes it to Rhaenyra, who is, you know, massively special. Um, and so it's just all of these things, like, you know, I just, I, it's just so much of a coincidence that this huge dragon riding family would have such, such tragedy, you know. Um, and then, what, like, one generation later, we're going to have even more tragedy, uh, with the dance of the dragons, and so it, it does seem it does seem like something is up, you know, like a Targaryen that's not supposed to get sick gets sick and dies. Um, you know, one decides to become a maester, another like run like dies dies in a horse riding accident, <laughs> one, one like you know can't deal with anybody and runs off to lice like. It's just, it's too much, it's too much tragedy at once. I mean, granted, I understand that the story has to, you know, demand a certain level of being contrived to get to a certain place, but mm -hmm. it's... Uh, Almost like George realized, oh, shit, I wrote too many Targaryens. Ah, I'll kill him. Fuck. Yeah, yeah, Gael. But the thing is, he didn't need to write this many Targaryens. Like, he didn't need for Jaehaerys and Alysanne to have fucking 52 kids. Like, <laughs> he could have he could have cut Gael... And 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 Alyssa and and all of these people from the story. <laughs> well, the rate at which she has children, you would think Targaryens were going extinct, and it was her job to repopulate all of them. Holy fuck! I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it just you know he could have had she could have had a few kids, and then then they told her like, oh, if you have any more, it's dangerous. Don't have any more. So she chose to not have any more. Like it could have just been that. Thank God she had thirteen kids because most of them fucking die. Like by the end of the <laughs> by the end of the chapter, by the end of her life, like three sur out of ten, three survive. Yeah. So holy fuck! I yeah. think I think the chapter ends with only slightly more Targaryens than when we be we kind of <laughs> began the whole Jaehaerys reign. Because when we began the whole Jaehaerys reign, we had Reina, Dreamfire Reina, Jaehaerys, and Alysanne, and now we're left with. At the end of the chapter, there's Jaehaerys, Balon, Vagon, and Sarah. And I think that's yeah. it. Yeah, and Vagon's <laughs> tucked away. So, yeah, right. of course. V v v Viserra, Alyssa, Gael, like, they're all dead, you know? They're it's all just... gone. So, it's, it's, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of parallels to different things that we see in the story, but, you know, for the most part... Oh, I wrote a few down, by the way. Okay, okay, what you got? Um, we'll get to that. So I, I just want I just want to uh, conclude the chapter on um, what I thought of it. Okay. You can definitely tell George loves the character of Jaehaerys, and by some mm -hmm. measure, Alysanne, giving them almost an entire novel's worth of material. 
And I feel as though, like like I said before, there's more that was likely cut out due to him wanting to cover the Dance of Dragons. It is interesting, though, that he switches. It's, it, it's very clear that, Alis- that Alisane is becoming the protagonist while, while Jaehaerys is, like, you know, fading in importance and fading in sympathy. Like, he's kind of a dick uh, in this chapter versus those early chapters. You're like, oh, what an auspicious, talented young man. And then in this chapter, you're like, wow, what a, what a dickhead, like <laughs> overbearing, you know, angry guy who like wants to control all of his family members and, you know, favors his boys over his girls and, you know, is cruel to, to various people at various times, you know, he's, he's definitely not as likable as he was earlier, but Alison becomes more sympathetic, you know, she enters the story. Well, she becomes more sympathetic. He becomes a bit colder with age. And yeah. he, he, I, I kind of understand where he's coming from because he kind of forces Dela to get married. And Alisane believes that was, you know, the final nail in her coffin when Dela had to give birth and just mm-hmm. couldn't, she just couldn't handle it. Um, I understand, and not to mention the whole Sarah thing, her going off. And at one point, uh, <laughs> I thought this was fucking hilarious alisane says oh no our child they made her a whore and he goes she was always a whore <laughs> holy fuck right, that's 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 some really cruel like horrible stuff like you know it's just eh. i mean yes obviously like you know the, the the whole slut shaming thing by modern standards is not is not cool but that's also your daughter and he he washes his hands of her um which is you know that's just that's you know it's shitty um, so what can you really do though? Like uh, to have that conversation, what can you really do? You don't like, you can try and support that decision as best as you can, but at the same time, it's, it's, you know, I wouldn't want my daughter going off and joining the pleasure. You'd house rather have, you'd rather have a, a brother fucking Alyssa. <laughs> like, hey now, uh, beggars can't be choosers. Let's, let's make that clear. <laughs> Oh, gosh. But uh, you can uh, tell that George loves this character. And uh, I, I feel like there's an entire novel within a novel in here. And Oh, yeah, many more. Yeah, this was, this was like reading 10,000 uh, years of solitude. Like, it's just <laughs> such a huge fucking family that just goes on and on and on. And you could probably um, have a sequel with, like, all of Jahari's children. Like, there's enough material here maybe to cover, like, their own short stories or, like, one giant novel. But yeah. the one thing... I did notice and um, wasn't a fan of was the fact that a few characters quietly go away or die off page. Mm. Uh, one character that kind of just goes away is uh, John Quill Drake, who was a part of Alisane's Queen's Guard, or yeah. Maegel Targaryen. She just dies quietly off page because yeah, I, I actually she gets don't like how Rene- how uh, Dreamfire Reyna just kind of dies, like at Harrenhal. Like, no, eh, she's gone. Like, yeah, Dreamfire like, Reyna, whose life is like filled with conflict and insanity, her she just goes away, just quietly off off screen, kind of like the Blackfish in a sense, you know, in Heron Hall. Right, because you you wonder like if Heron Hall is supposedly filled with all of the sorcery and and, and such, you know, from from Heron the Black to Danelle Lothston and and all of the haunting ghosts that 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 Arya like sees, you know, and feels when she's there, like. What is what is Dreamfire Reina doing there? Like what like why did she go there? Like what what is there that like how does she fit into that story? Um I mean in a in a literal sense, like why would she want to go to Heron Hall, a depressing ruin? But also in like a metaphorical sense, like how does Dreamfire Reina like fit with that history? Like, yes, she's a sad like widow and there's like the wi- the the wailing tower and all of that, but but how does that really fit? Like she didn't really mourn her husband. She's not really. She's more. She mourns her daughters. Um, you know. So so how does she really fit? Even like you know, um, uh, you know, thematically to to going to Heron Hall. And it's never really explained. It's just oh, she went to Heron Hall and then she died quietly at Heron Hall. Like, I'm oh. assuming the implication here is that. There was really not th- nothing left for her on Dragonstone and King's Landing. It was mostly Jaehaerys' his, his family now. Like, his family was taken over. There was nothing left for her. And yeah. I guess she wanted some choice in how she goes out. I, I mean, in general, the Rainey story 
is kind of dying with a whimper. You have this like long conflict of her having these dragons and having this conflict, and then all of a sudden, like she just, you know, loses loses support slowly over the years, and then chooses to go to Heron Hall and die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like okay. Mm. There's a few things I also noticed, um, just small tidbits in the chapter that are worth pointing out. Uh, Jaehaerys begins the construction of the King's Road. Yeah. Uh, we also see some of the first examples of Kingsguard who break their vow and the punishment that follow. And we get right, that they here. Needed to, they needed to shoehorn that in because it was randomly mentioned by, by Aerys Oakhart in the Soiled Knight chapter. Mm -hmm. um, Luca Moore Strong, right? It's Who was funny, discovered but... to have like secretly married three women, having sixteen children. He's castrated and sent to the wall. Yeah, it's funny. I, I I kind of have this like like so you know how in like the original Star Wars now, uh, forty three years later, has every line has been obsessed over, and so now there's like a backstory novelization about every random piece of shit. Like that's happened in the original trilogy, right? Well, like, they did it. They did it before, but they became legends, and they did it, they did it again. Like even right. random Death Star gunners have their own stories now, right? Like 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 oh that you know that that weird buffalo man in the corner of the bar. He can't just be a weird buffalo man who wanted to like have a drink randomly on a Wednesday. No, he had this like massively rich backstory filled with adventures, and you're like. He couldn't have just been like a fucking moisture farmer who wanted to get a drink on Wednesday. Like, no, he has this massive story where he's, you know, a secret spy. And, you know, oh, God. We like, mentioned this during the Mandalorian podcast. Like, everybody in the cantina has way more insidious things going on than Luke trying to get passage to Alderaan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Like, like, <laughs> like, everybody else has a more interesting story than them just wanting to get, you know, passage to Alderaan. So the, the, it's the same, like, Aries Oakhart randomly mentions Lucamore Strong, and Lucamore needed to exist in order to <clears throat> be this example of, 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 you know, of what happens to Kingsguard and how, how Aries Oakhart is feeling guilty for breaking his vows, even though nobody else seems to feel guilty for breaking their vows. Um, and everybody, everybody seems to be having affairs Except for for Aerys Oakhart. Well, actually, no. I guess Aerys Oakhart is having an affair. But every, you know, and he mentions Lucamore Strong, and it's a throwaway story, and it doesn't need any more. Like we don't need to delve into it. But no, they they had to delve into it. They're like, no. I, I disagree gonna... with you on this one. <laughs> Isn't this like a cautionary tale for what happens when the King's Guard oversteps and break their vows uh, in regards to the Dance with Dragons? I guess, but you know, it takes this like random piece of world building that was just. A throwaway line and it's like well now we're gonna have to like flesh it out and now you know and now when Ari Sokart says that we have this whole story uh, around it but. see I actually didn't mind it that much even though it's a bit more random than the story of the woman Rogar Baratheon sent to try and seduce Jaehaerys when he was younger that actually had a bit more plot relevance than this considering Lucamore's actions don't really impact any main or minor character in the chapter but even so, I still prefer this random story than the one about the woman trying to seduce Jaehaerys. Like, Alyssa Farman's journey and Lucamore's vows are little short stories in the chapter that I would rather keep seeing more of, you know? Because they're interesting and, and they add more world building and lore to, like, you know, the whole thing. Which is always a plus for me, so I didn't mind it that much. I mean, do you think that... <laughs> I wonder, like, when, when George was sitting down writing this chapter... If they're like, okay, these are the things that need to go into this chapter. And he had a checklist. He's like, Alyssa Farman's fate, is the world round? Um, and then he, he'd, written, he'd done a family tree uh, for the world of ice and fire. So he's like, fuck, I've got to talk about every single person on this goddamn family tree. I've got to go like <laughs> one after the other and explain it all. Check, 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 check. Uh, Lucamore Strong, I've got to talk about him. I have to have, you know, Dreamfire Rana dying. Uh, check, 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 all these different things that he, you know, it was, a, so there's a bit of a checklist with this. Like he's got to get through them. He's got to get through each and every one of them. The King's Road was built at some point. I've got to, I've got to mention that. Um, fuck. 
But you know what the you know the fans would get on his fucking case if George didn't put all this crap in there. He had to. It was kind of forced. Yeah. Like uh, he could it couldn't just be like, when was the King's Road built? It was built slowly and at, at no like m- you know major one point and added to by <laughs> many kings, much like say the Great Wall of China. If you sort of say like who built the Great Wall of China? Well, Many, many generations built the Great Wall of China. Like, they added to it, they rebuilt certain parts, they built other parts, certain parts fell down. Like, you know, it gets to the, gets to the point where, like, no one person can really take claim to it. And it's like, it's the same with the King, it should be the same with the King's Road, but no, you know, Jaharis just built it. <laughs> we also have some notable deaths in this chapter, aside from Alistair's children, uh, Maester Benefer, and most of Jaharis' small yeah. council die from the shivers. We also get the death of uh, uh, Balerion the Black Dread, who dies of old age. And soon after him, so does Septon Barth. Well, I, I think it's interesting that he dies like a year after being claimed. Balerion? By Viserys I, I believe. Yeah. yeah. So, now also I wanted to discuss briefly some of the things I noticed that uh, were kind of a... A comparison to what we've seen in Ice and Fire. We have another Aaron, Roderick, who in the story is an older man, but he became Lord of the Vale at a very young age. Kind of a callback to Robin, mm-hmm. uh, to Sweet Robin. House Baratheon's black hair is mentioned a few times, and they make a point of how strong the gene pool is. Of course. Uh, of course. <laughs> by the by the way, like them make them mentioning that is is ridiculous because like now it's not some obscure thing that um that you know amazed that uh that Picel like researches or john aaron researches now it's like oh apparently it was in like all the fucking major histories as well like and it wasn't like like you know a hard researched fact you know it's it's it sucks that they put that in because it, it contradicts the first book uh what else we also have uh Tymon lannister being incredibly good looking and very fond of women and wine somewhat of a combo of jamie and Tyrion. Mm-hmm. and then we also have red roy connington who chose mm-hmm. exile and essos after the sarah X incident right a combination of red ronnet and john connington yeah mm-hmm. and then john uh, connington you... with the exile and red ronnet you know just kind of a name and uh they describe him having a temper I think so. I don't recall. Okay. But you also mentioned, uh, I added to the list, Rigo Draz with the High mm-hmm. Septon and how they were taken out in uh, Clash of Kings. Rogar and Robert, the way they wanted to go out. And uh, Sarah mimicking Jorah's wife. Um, what was her name again? Hightower? It was... Um, Liness. Liness, yeah. right. How but she becomes also the, some... the And then some people think there's also a to Illyrio Sarah. Because Illyrio Sarah was also... A sex worker, um, and with the same name, so, or maybe it was Sara. I don't know. So, these are the the final comparisons I have. Overall, the chapter was fairly. Um, I wouldn't say it's boring because it wasn't boring. Uh, was it good? It was all right. Just very long closing out this man's life. And yeah, there wasn't any cohesive like place that the story was going to. I mean, it's tough because it's it's a time of peace and. These characters aren't driven to like conquer a certain area or, or fight in a certain battle. Mm-hmm. But it did seem like a lot of random shit that they just all threw together in one big long chapter. And then and they needed time to pass. So, you know. It well, happened. it goes back and forth between their kids. And once again, it, it just kind of it doesn't bother me. But it's just something I noticed that Alisane's daughters fall um, within like one or two categories there's never a really middle ground there. <laughs> there's, there's never like you know, somewhat well-rounded person that that <laughs> that is, that is not either Arya or you know, a, Sansa. A, 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 no, not even Sansa. It's like it's like every character is either uh, Sweet Robin or Arya, right? <laughs> like. <laughs> Or yeah, I mean, pretty much. I guess you have a super bookish one, so maybe he's a Rhaegar character. I don't know, you know? Like, but it's clearly like George again. Like, he has a super bookish character, which is like a Quentin Martell, Rhaegar, Rhaegar Targaryen book, you know? Um, 
But, you know, George, he writes everybody in these extremes. Like, and to be fair to him, he has very limited pages, so he can't give everyone, like, a distinct personality, but right, we're given the abridged version of it. Yeah, he has to do it quickly. And it, it's funny because we've read enough of him where it, it starts becoming repetitive, but it's funny because you go to other writers and you realize, like, oh, God, like, I, I can't tell one character from the other. George R. R. Martin is really good at this. Um, even, even though we start seeing his patterns, that pattern is still better than having all characters be the same. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine was talking about how he read the, uh, the Magicians trilogy uh, by Lev Grossman. And he's just like, every character is exactly the same. They're all like super dry and sarcastic and super intelligent. And, you know, there's no difference to any of them and they all run together, you know? And it's like, yeah, fair enough, you know? Yeah, that's, I'd, I, I've read a couple of books like that and mm, every, every character has right. a joke to say and they're all funny and... Mm. Yeah, so like, I mean, with, with George R. R. Martin, like, yeah, like... Within a, within a moment, we can, we can feel a, person, a, a character's personality. Like, very little is written about, um, uh, say, well, say Dagmar Clefjaw. Like, very li little is, is written about him, but he has a very short conversation with Fionn. And you feel like you know his character very well. Like, he's very vivid in my mind. Um, you know, very little is uh, said about, say, say, um, um, uh, Stannis's um, uh, kingsmen, like that, that surround him, like like uh, Justin Massey. But you feel like you really know Justin Massey, like you know, even though his you know his interaction with Asha and then Stannis is pretty short. But you feel like you know him, like you know, easy easy with smiles, arrogant, you know, good looking guy. But you know, uh, you know, not 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 exactly that courageous. You know? like, <laughs> A little wormsy, you know, and so he's good at it. But um, you you start seeing the patterns, you know, when you go when you go when you have two thousand characters, and George literally has two thousand characters, you know, they they start repeating. What did you think of the chapter? Uh, I mean, there are parts. That's the thing is, it didn't feel like one chapter. There were parts that were very interesting, like like the journey, like the journey west, of course, um, and and stuff like that, but. It didn't feel like a cohesive chapter. Like, it's not like when I, you know, and I didn't really care about where the characters were going. You can't, you know, it's like you introduce a character and then the character dies, you know, and, and I didn't really have any time to get attached to them. So you, the only thing you're feeling is like Alisane's pain or Jaehaerys' anger, because those are the only characters you know. Or like Rogar, I suppose I felt something with like Rogar's situation because we've, we've really gotten to know Rog Rogar Baratheon at this point. Mm -hmm. um, or when like you know Dreamfire Reina dies, like we've really gotten to know Dreamfire Reina, so it's you know those parts, even though they're very short and brief, like they stick with me more than having a long story about Alyssa. Like I don't know Alyssa. You've introduced her. I don't care about her. She's dead. <laughs> you know, like you know Vagon. Okay, you you've introduced him. You've given him personality. I still don't care about him. He's gone. He's never coming back. Like, we're never going to mention him again. But I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It was eh. okay. It, but... it, it, yeah, exactly. It was okay. Uh, next time, we'll focus on the uh, question of succession. How is that chapter looking like? Um, I, I just, I don't know. I can't imagine it being as long as... <laughs> do, you want me to, do you want me to do a count? We'll get there, Preston. We... We'll we'll finish this before Winds of Winters comes out. This is this is the, so question of succession. This is where it starts getting really suspicious. Where you're just like, wait a minute, why isn't Rhaenys the queen who never was like queen? Like, is there going to be a good reason? Like, because definitely when they get to Rhaenyra and how much they screw over Rhaenyra, there is no good explanation for why they screwed over Rhaenyra, other than this girl can hatch dragons. And you mean Rhaenys? She, well, I think the same thing. The Queen Who Never Was and eventually Rhaenyra. Um, well, it's the same. Dreamfire, Dreamfire Reina is kind of the first one of like, why are they, are they shafting this woman? Rhaenys, the Queen Who Never Was. Um, they also shaft her. And then Rhaenyra obviously gets the huge shaft. Oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> why Rhaenyra is, you know, why anyone, like, 
it's just ridiculous. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But the question of succession, maybe we'll, we'll get into that. But it's, it's, hard to, it's hard for me to like not see conspiracy when you're just like, there's, there's just no logic to this. There's no logic. And uh, the Rogue Prince here, can, can I ask you f to send me the, uh, the, the music for the Rogue Prince? Because <laughs> every time we mention them, people always get annoyed that I don't, we don't play, the, uh, we don't play the, the, the song, the theme. Uh, all right, all right, I'll do that. I'll do that. Uh, Preston, can we wrap it up? Sure thing. Guys, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Thrones Podcast. We will be back next time with more Fire and Blood. We're still continuing on. And just as a reminder, we will be bringing back the Q&As, so stay tuned for more info on that. But as always, we'll see you guys next time. Have a good one.